History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to this 424th episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast, Ghost Tours for the Theater of the Mind. I am your host, Diane. And this is Kelly. Kelly, on this episode, we're going to be hitting a spot in Tennessee. This is the Thomas House Hotel. It's got a few ghosts going on there. Excellent. Before we get into that, we want to welcome into the spectacular crew, Virginia, Sharon, Crystal, Kristen, Vanessa, and Morgan. Thank you for joining us in our Facebook group. And now, this moment, Naughty. The moment in Oddity was suggested by Jennifer Guthrie. Central Park in New York City breaks up the metropolitan expanse of skyscrapers with a natural space. Back in the early 1800s, Lower Manhattan had become a dangerous place and very crowded. Plots in the open countryside that would eventually become Central Park were very cheap. John and Elizabeth Whitehead had owned the farmland here, and they started selling plots. The first man to buy a plot was a black shoe shiner named Andrew Williams. Several hundred people of color bought up more plots, and they founded Seneca Village. Irish and German immigrants came to the area as well. This village was a perfect example of racial harmony for a middle-class group of people. On July 21, 1853, that all ended when New York City used eminent domain to take ownership of Seneca Village so they could make Central Park to satisfy the wealthy New York families. And the history and evidence of Seneca Village just disappeared. And what was allowed to be told about the village were lies, claiming that it had been home to squatters and was swampland offering little more than squalid conditions. This changed in the 1990s when historians began to piece together the truth. Archaeological digs have also taken place to ascertain where the village was and to uncover more information. Managing to disappear a whole village and hide the truth about it for over a hundred years certainly is odd. You're not afraid of a little ghost, are you? And now, this month in history. In the month of February, on the 15th in 1953, Tenley Albright became the first American female to win the World Figure Skating Championship. Tinley began her skating career as a young girl on a man-made flooded and iced-over area behind the family home. Her father had created the space for her and her friends. She started entering competitions when she was 11 years old. And then polio hit. Tinley's case was mild and rehab honed her skating skills. She won a silver medal at the 1952 Olympics, but eclipsed that with her world championship win. She performed feats never performed by a female skater before. In an age when we have women that are performing quads, it may not sound impressive that Tenley pulled off a double axle, double loop, double rip barrier, and double sow cow. But at the time, it was amazing. Many thought that she would go on to become a professional skater, but she opted for school. She competed at the Winter Olympics in 1956 and became the first American female gold medalist in figure skating and then entered Harvard Medical School, following in the footsteps of her surgeon father. She became a noted surgeon, Today, she's 86 and lives in Massachusetts. The 1880s were a time of great interest in the healing powers of mineral springs, and one of those springs we haven't covered yet was Red Boiling Springs in Tennessee. 
Hotels were often built near these springs, and one of them that was constructed here is today known as the Thomas House Hotel. This seems to be an incredibly haunted location that has been featured on several paranormal television shows, and the hotel regularly offers ghost hunts. Join us for the history and haunts of the Thomas House Hotel. Red Boiling Springs, and let me just say, I don't know that I'd be tempted to get into something called Red Boiling Spring. (laughs) This is in a valley on the Highland Rim in Macon County in the Upper Cumberland region of Middle Tennessee. This is about 70 miles northeast of Nashville to give people a better idea of where this is located. Mineral Springs were not the first thing to bring people into the Red Boiling Springs area. A salt lick attracted animals and Native Americans, and so the area was named Salt Lick Creek. Attracting animals was good for hunting, and men like Daniel Boone traversed the animal trails, leaving their mark behind. He carved 1775 and his name on a beech tree here. At least according to legend, I didn't see any pictures. Land grants were issued starting in the 1780s. The city of Salt Lake Creek was officially founded with a post office in 1829. By 1847, the town had been renamed Red Boiling Springs in honor of the red-colored sulfur mineral water that bubbled up from the springs. Like bubbling crude? (laughs) yeah i don't think red colored sulfur water is gonna make a whole lot of money for anybody but well especially when it smells like sulfur that's true (laughs) although oil doesn't have a real great smell either there were several types of mineral waters here differentiated mostly by color names there was red water which had iron and sulfur and high levels of calcium and magnesium with a somewhat agreeable taste Black water had the same minerals, but had a horrible taste and turned silver coins black. I don't think I'd be drinking that. No. What does that do to your insides? (laughs) Exactly. The white water was used for dyspepsia. Freestone water had very little mineral content, so tasted pretty good. The double and twist water apparently made drinkers do that, so we imagine it was pretty gross. People not only drank the waters, but also soaked or bathed in them. I mean, just based on the smell of sulfur and the weird color, no way am I touching that. I won't even drink our tap water here in Florida because to me, I think it tastes like swamp water. (laughs) And, you know, we get the little report. It says it's okay, but I'm like, no, it tastes funny. And the double and twist. Can you imagine what that must do to you if it's like it made people double over and twist around? (laughs) Don't put that in your body. (laughs) Attention was brought to these springs by a woman named Aunt Suki Goad. Love that name. She claimed that she drank from the sulfur water and that it cured her issue with dropsy. Do you know what dropsy is, Kelly? I don't. It just reminds me of my dad having drop foot. (laughs) Which it has no correlation with. I thought maybe that was the same thing. But it actually is a term used for an accumulation of excess water in the body tissue. So basically, this would be like edema from congestive heart failure. Gotcha. She developed a salve from the water that she called Aunt Sookie's Salve, and she sold it as a medical product. Aunt Sookie's brother, John D. Kirby, also claimed that the mineral water had healed his sore eyes. People started coming to the area and setting up tents so they could partake of the healing waters. Most of these springs were on the Jesse Jones farm, and he happily sold a 20-acre plot surrounding the springs to a businessman named Samuel Hare. Hare envisioned a great enterprise. He had seen other businessmen around the country buy up land near Mineral Springs and then build inns to bring people in to partake of the health benefits of the water. And we love that these entrepreneurs did this kind of thing because it seems like nearly all of these hotels connected to these Mineral Springs have hauntings. Which makes you wonder what that water absorbs or brings in because, I mean, there are so many of them. Mineral Springs Hotel, Eureka Springs down there at the Crescent Hotel. If I drank some of those waters that were described, I would have a haunting of some sort. <laughs> I, I mean, guarantee you, it. You wonder why it never cured any of these people. It probably actually killed them and they didn't know it. That's why they're haunted. <laughs> One has to wonder if the use of these waters that were considered sacred by the indigenous people who lived near them led to these hauntings because elemental land and water spirits have been angered. Samuel Hare did go on to build his inn in 1844, but he didn't focus on the roads, which were very poor. 
Those poor roads and the remoteness of his inn led it to being closed by the 1870s. You know, a lot of these places had the opposite issue when roads would lead away from there when the highways got built and everything. This guy didn't even bother to make sure the roads were built to come to him. You got to get people there. James Bennett was the next businessman to step up and try his hand at running a resort at the Springs. In 1876, he opened up his resort, which was several log cabins and a dining hall. A stagecoach line had been developed between Gallatin and Red Boiling Springs, which helped this endeavor to be more successful. New York businessman James F.O. Shaughnessy bought the tract of land from Bennett in the 1880s and started developing a bigger resort. Zach and Clay Cloyd were general store owners in Red Boiling Springs, and they decided to take advantage of the growing reputation of the town as a mineral spring resort. They built the Cloyd Hotel in 1890. This was a two-story white weatherboard building with long two-story verandas. In 1905, the Red Boiling Springs Water and Realty Company was formed and bought the initial track from Shaughnessy. Ten years later, they replaced Shaughnessy's hotel with a bigger and more lavish hotel they called the Palace. Several other hotels would be built, including the Central Hotel and the Donahoe. The Springs here did well into the 1930s, which was better than most areas, and there was plenty of entertainment, too. Lots of games were played and circuses would come to town, as well as minstrel shows. Red Boiling Springs had its height of popularity during World War I and II. Eventually, people lost interest in the springs, and the hotels fell into disrepair. The town became a shell of its former self, and then a large flood in 1969 destroyed many businesses and homes and killed two little girls. But the former Cloyd Hotel, now known as the Thomas House Hotel, is still here and apparently crazy haunted. The current hotel is not the original. That one burned down in 1924. It was rebuilt by Joseph H. Peters in 1927. He had purchased the hotel from the Cloyds in 1916 when they could no longer afford to run it, and he continued to call it the Cloyd Hotel. The hotel was kept at two stories with 50 rooms and two community bathrooms. But this one was built from red brick and had an arcaded portico, as described by its application for historical designation. This confused us a bit because arcades and porticos are different, so we aren't sure why this verbiage was used. Porticos have horizontal beams across the top versus the arches of arcades. Yeah, so why they used that particular description, I have no idea. Maybe there's some architectural study type people out there that listen and you can enlighten us, but I could not figure out why they would put those two together because it's usually one or the other. The red bricks were made on site. The hotel offered patrons three meals a day, served family style. Can you imagine going to a hotel that offered you three meals a day to go with your stay? I think that'd be fantastic. However, I'm not a fan of community bathrooms, as you well know. (laughs) That's true. I'm not either. So, But you got three meals. So maybe you could put up with having to wait for the toilet. Mm. And I always wonder when it's a community bathroom, because, you know, nowadays... Like if you're in a dorm or something like that, there's several showers, several toilets. I don't know that these hotels were built that way necessarily. I'm not sure. The hotel was bought by Dr. A.T. Hall in 1950, and he updated the hotel, adding a bowling alley, miniature golf course, and swimming pool. Unfortunately, Edwin Ward Rush would drown in that pool in 1961 at the age of seven. Professional wrestler Lester Morgan bought the hotel in 1973, and he held on to it for a short period of time. He was foreclosed on in 1974, unable to make the hotel profitable, even though he kept a live bear inside the hotel as entertainment. Oh, my word. (laughs) And I believe what I'd read is that he didn't even make one payment against the loan that he took out. That's why it was so quickly foreclosed on. Oh, my gosh. I would imagine. I, I don't know if I'm assuming it was the bear was in a cage. Evan Moss bought the property and opened up the Mossy Creek Summer Camp for children in 1983. The camp closed in 1988, and the Anzara Corporation bought the building and renamed it the Anzara Hotel. This was not a real business group. It was actually a religious cult. Lovely. (laughs) This hotel and the other two still open in Red Boiling Springs were used as basically a commune. So they bought it all up so they'd have places for their cult members to live. Not much is known about this group, but they are described as an Armageddon cult that liked to summon the dead. So um, possibly some of the hauntings that that could be what's leading (laughs) to some of this. But I love that description. So what exactly are you guys about Armageddon? And we like to talk to dead people. Okay, I think I'd love to join that group. Penny Good Evans wrote of her time with the cult in her article, My Time with a Cult. I guess that's pretty descriptive, isn't it? (laughs) 
<laughs> I'm sorry. That was so rude of me, but I couldn't help it. Be tickled my funny bone. It's like, hi, I have my memoir. It's called My Time with a Cult. We stayed at all three hotels and read Boiling at different times, but for a few months we lived at the Anzara. I was 17 then and very naive. I knew nothing of cults or anything like that and wasn't even sure they were a cult until we'd left. And Dateline or one of those shows did a piece on them somewhere around 1990. By the time they did the piece, the cult had picked up and split. Anyway, my boyfriend and I got a room at the Anzara. At that time, there was a very big, hard-nosed woman who owned the hotel. She was the leader of the cult. And in the beginning, I thought they were just Baptists or something. And I remember telling her, I'm a Christian Baptist. She looked at me like I was stupid. Yeah, I think most uh, Baptists are into trying to summon the dead. Good grief. I mean, really. Our room was downstairs by the laundry room. I remember some strange people staying there, which I chalked up to just people being strange. My 17-year-old mind was blown, though, one night very late when my boyfriend went down to the kitchen. We were allowed use of the kitchen and saw the people staying at the hotel naked and dancing in the dining room. Oh, my. I guess it's not <laughs> dancing around a fire outside in the I moonlight. Guess. Oh, my word. I, I like, just can't even imagine. <laughs> I just want a sandwich. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You're terrible. <laughs> he ran back to our room like, what the bleep did I just see? I remember also there was a very rich lady staying at the hotel. I now know the cult was milking her for her money, but back then I wasn't hip to people on their motives. Anyway, so this fancy pants lady <laughs> was from New York City. She's entertaining. And she had a little white dog, and she and I would sit on the swing on the front porch, and I would smoke her Pall Mall filterless cigarettes with her and almost die because they had no filter. And we had a lot of long talks. I don't remember now about what, but I really like this lady. I do remember that she was sad and she seemed very lonely, which is probably why she was in a cult. It was summer then and I recall that she drank a lot of sweet tea, is how I like to say it, a little bit of sweet tea. Funny as I think of our time there, I also remember that there was a front desk in the foyer with an old-fashioned cash register and back then it cost $50 a week to stay at the hotel and my boyfriend would pay our fee and then when the cult leaders were out of sight, he would go back and hit the no-sale button and take our money back. Oh my word. <laughs> So uh, interesting little cult she was hanging out there with. And she added a little epilogue to this story and it just went on and on. But I'll just cut to the chase with it. One night they were hankering for some snacks. So went down to the little snack thing and they grabbed all the ding dongs and the ho-hos and the Twinkies and all that stuff. Brought them back to their room and they were just eating away. And this was about the time that she stopped to think, you know, Jim Jones poisoned that Kool-Aid. Do you think they would try oh. to poison the snack food? So then she said oh the whole gosh. night they were worried they were poisoned and going to die. Yikes. Not the time that you want to start considering that after you've eaten it. That ho-ho is making me feel a little funny. The Anzara Corporation collapsed in 1992. A fire in the 1990s destroyed one of the wings, but this was rebuilt. And now a little break for a word about one of our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Surfshark. Kelly, we're always mindful about safety and security when entering haunted locations, but we aren't always thinking about that when we're online. You're right. Websites, hackers, and other third-party trackers latch onto us when we're online and watch our online activity, and then they sell that data. It can be hard to get rid of a ghost that follows us home, but online threats are much easier to block when we use a VPN. A VPN can hide our location and make it hard to track us online. Kind of like a cloak of invisibility. Yep, and a VPN does even more than that. If we're trying to access a website or stream something like a UK ghost show that we can't access in the US, we can use a VPN to switch our virtual location to somewhere like the UK and bingo, we can watch those shows. Awesome. And don't forget that sometimes there's better deals to be found online while shopping if you change your online location. We've been using Surfshark VPN for all of those reasons, and it's been great. It's easy to use and affordable, and anyone can try out Surfshark completely risk-free because they have a 30-day money-back guarantee. Get Surfshark VPN at surfshark.deals bump. Enter promo code bump for 83% off and three extra months free. Well, I think I'll go do some online shopping. That cloak of invisibility is just calling my name. Get Surfshark VPN at surfshark.deals bump. Enter promo code bump for 83% off and 3 extra months for free. 
And this episode is brought to you by Best Fiends. Kelly, Best Fiends is my favorite way to show my brain some love. Whenever I need to recharge or just relax, think about something else other than work, there's Best Fiends. The game has tons of cute characters, and they help you solve thousands of puzzles. And the more you play, the more characters you get. They have tons. And the more you win, the more challenges you face. I mean, the latest fiend that we've been working to try to get is Beatrice, and she's so cute, we have no idea what she is. She looks like the cross between a duck and a bee. (laughs) She's adorable, and you get to help furnish her airship. I know. Which is even cooler. Steampunk. Ah. Kelly, what level are you on? I'm on level 427. I'm at 318, so you're a bit ahead of me. Apparently, you've had more free time than I do. (laughs) You're catching up quite quickly, however. It is so much fun, and it seems like the fun is never going to end because I saw the other day it said that there's at least 6,000 levels. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. For those that don't know, Best Fiends is one of those match three games, and it's so much fun, and you do a lot more than just matching three. There are a lot of like bombs that drop and beehives and all kinds of challenges that you've got to get through. The fiends are your friends. They're so cute. They help you along the way. And you're trying to beat up these slugs and the slug bosses who are ugly and hideous. And then they spit out this slug slime. I don't know what it is. (laughs) Slug slime. What I love about it is you can play it without Wi-Fi. When I was flying back to California, I cleared so many levels. It was fantastic. Well, if you want to join us and be another of the 100 million downloads that Best Fiends has gotten... Head over to the App Store or Google Play and download Best Fiends for free today. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. Are you ready to give your brain some TLC? Download Best Fiends free today on the App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. You'll be glad you did. Today, the hotel is owned by the Cole family, who acquired it in 1993, and features a 125-seat dining room with a stage that hosts events and shows. There are 15 rooms with private bathrooms, thank God, for rent, (laughs) and they offer Ghost Hunt Weekends. Chad Morin, owner of Ghost Hunt Weekends, said, We go every month and several times a month, and fans of the paranormal can join us. We have dinner. We show you our documentary that it took me about six years to produce, and it tells about the history and the haunts of the Thomas House Hotel and of the area. We've had doors opening and closing. We've had a ball captured on video roll across the floor. We've heard screams. We've heard talking. We've heard whistling. We've seen shadow people. We've seen the apparition of a little child and another one of a tall man. That the only thing we can figure out is that he's the previous owner from the 1900s that still wanders the halls. It's a great time. There's nothing evil or malevolent there. It seems like the spirits there are the previous hotel owner and some children. It seems like they enjoy being there and the company. The most haunted room at the hotel is said to be room 37. Loud crashes have been heard, the sound of bricks falling even though no bricks are found laying around, and a shadow figure has been seen going through the front door, and then it stood next to a chair before disappearing. The young daughter of one of the Cloyd brothers, Sarah, died at the hotel and her spirit has been seen mainly in room 37. That room is full of toys just for Sarah. A guest who fell off a horse and died is thought to haunt the property too. Cherry Cole was so unsettled by things going on at the hotel that she was unwilling to be in it at night and she is the wife of the owner or she's the co-owner with her husband. Guests hear a man whistling through the hotel And guests sometimes wake up in the middle of the night to see a female apparition staring down at them. In 2012, during Season 8, ghost hunters visited the location. Cherry told Jason and Grant that people regularly heard footsteps walking around above them when nobody is on the upper floor. Her husband, Daryl, claimed to have seen the apparition of an elderly man, but he didn't know it was a ghost until he asked him if he could help him, and he disappeared right before his eyes. Apparently, Mr. Cloyd whistled all the time, so they think he is the whistler. Their daughter-in-law, Destiny, said that one night she was looking down as she walked the hallway and ran into something. She looked up, and there was a tall, thin man standing there. She had never seen him before, and when he disappeared, she realized he was a ghost. A lady dressed in pink has been seen by a member of the Cole family, too. She had white hair, smiled, and then faded away. 
these ghosts like to disappear once they've been seen, it seems. <laughs> and what's interesting is clearly they know the location is haunted, but they're constantly thinking that they're actual people. I guess they must just look really corporal until they fade away. Yeah, which is really interesting to me because for you to even see a full bodied apparition is pretty amazing. And they've seen them many times. And like you said, to the point where it's like, oh, it's a real person. Can I help you do something for you? And then they're gone. So yeah, it's amazing. During the investigation, Jason and Grant heard disembodied footsteps on the second floor and like something being dragged. There was also audible whistling. It was really loud and I got chills listening to it because you could hear it. You know, sometimes you can't hear on the TV what they're hearing, but you could definitely hear that. And then they played it back again and you could hear this whistling. Adam Barry and Amy Bruni were also on this episode and it was back, Kelly, when Adam was just an investigator in training. Very cool. He looked like a little boy. <laughs> They asked for the spirit to knock to let them know it was there, and there was a knock. They asked for two knocks, and then there were two knocks. So that's how you know you're dealing with something intelligent and that it wasn't just by chance that something happened to knock at the same time that you asked for it. This was in room 16. Amy and Adam were whistling in the area where the whistler made noise with Grant and Jason, and they heard whistling in response. Tango and Steve heard a female voice moaning. They thought it might have been Sarah. Later, in an area that had a ton of dolls, Jason and Grant were calling out to Sarah and asking if she wanted to play with the dolls, and they heard the audible voice of a little girl. We heard it, too, very clear. So I'm saying we heard the voice very clear, but it wasn't real easy to make out what she had said. It was something like, those are my toys, or I like toys. You could definitely hear toys. It really did sound like there was a little girl right there in the room. Yeah, and I mean, it was, it was audible. Amazing. It wasn't an EVP. It was out loud so that you could hear it. Amy did the flashlight experiment with Sarah, and she turned off the flashlight when she was asked to do so. And then she stopped playing with the flashlight. Amy asked if she stopped playing because she was told to stop, and the light turned on. The spirit let her know that she was more than five years old, also by turning on the flashlight. I think Amy had like three flashlights sitting there, and she said, if you are older than five years old, please turn on the middle flashlight. And she turned that one on, so she knew that she was more than that. But it always bothers me when you have a spirit that says somebody's controlling them or not letting them do something. Now, I don't know if it's because she is a little girl and an adult spirit has kind of taken her under their wing and is like, you know, stop playing with them. You shouldn't communicate with them or whatever. But yeah, it was just weird because all of a sudden Amy was like, oh, she's, you know, turning on and off the flashlight when we're asking. And then it was like nothing. But she felt like there was still a presence there. Like you and I will get to a point where the flashlight stops working or the dousing rods stop working. And we're like, right. the energy feels like it's left the room. She could feel the energy was still there. So then she's like, is there somebody saying you can't do that anymore? And it was like, yep. Katrina and Jack visited this location in season two of Portals to Hell. They think they communicated with an elemental. Katrina saw a tiny blue light. And then shortly after that, Jack saw a shadow move across behind their cameraman, Scott. And the blue light really was interesting to me because we've talked about the blue lights before. And usually a will-o'-the-wisp is described as being some kind of a blue light. And so it does make you wonder if they thought they were communicating with an elemental and then they see a blue light. Is that correlating that way? As Jack was describing that, he, Katrina, and a producer all saw another orb of light appear and then disappear. They caught it on camera and it was weird. A dark force had been traced to a hallway, and the camera in that hallway shut off when they were in there. Jack claimed that this force kept waking him up in the middle of the night, and Katrina said that it had pulled hard on her ear. They did a geobox session in the Cloyd Chapel that is also owned by the Cole family. This has been an ongoing restoration project for the Coles, Ghost Hunt Weekends, and author Kyle Cobb. When they asked if someone was in there, Hell No came through the box. And you know, that geo box always sounds so creepy as it is. So then that really sounded creepy <laughs> hearing does. hell no. And actually, we're going to go ahead and play that for you right here. It got really cold in here. So is this where you are? Hell no. Hell no. Then the name Rohepishaw came through the box and Katrina repeated it and the box said it again. I don't know exactly how a geo box works. It's supposed to be similar to a spirit box. That name is not going to come through on a radio signal. I'm sorry. I would not imagine so. And you could hear it. And I heard it both times and I was like, Rohepishal, what is that? It was said that Rohepishal is an Algonquin word for spirit. So maybe that's why it said that name. 
a whole group of coyotes started howling outside suddenly when they decided to go dark and silent. So while they were doing the geo box, they had some of the lights were going, they had some candles going and stuff. But when they turned everything off, all of a sudden, this group of coyotes started going crazy, which if you heard a group of coyotes howling, it can be very unnerving. They don't sound like wolves. They they do this yippy, weird kind of noise. And so it was like, whoa, maybe it was a coincidence. Maybe. But since they thought they were dealing with an elemental, it was a bit chilling to hear. This elemental seemed to be connected to the water, and possibly angry because the springs were sucked dry by people. So it isn't just the hotel that is haunted, but perhaps the entire area where the springs were. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure how far the chapel is from the actual hotel. It seemed like they were kind of close to each other and on the same property. And I found it really interesting because you go from listening to the people who owned it, talking to ghost hunters, and then them doing their investigation... Everything is very tame. You know, your flashlights turning on and off. We're hearing a little girl's voice. Nothing is malevolent. You even have the guy who hosts the Ghost Hunt Weekend saying, yeah, there's really nothing bad here. So then when I saw that Katrina and Jack went there for Portals to Hell, I was like, well, usually they're trying to go to some pretty crazy places when they're doing those shows. And then the stuff they had going on was just like, holy cow, they are definitely getting some kind of negative energy going on here. Interesting. So it does make you wonder if the elemental kind of stays outside of the hotel. And so that's why they were getting it when they weren't in the actual hotel. Could be. But it is kind of creepy that they were in a chapel and getting a lot of this stuff. I tried to look up this Rohepa shawl for myself because I like to see it for myself that something says the Algonquin word here for spirit is this. I couldn't find anything like that. So I don't know for sure that that's true. Hmm. I don't know if it's just the show that was saying that. I'd love to find out if that is true. But it is an interesting word to have pop up like that. And I hope that really is what's going on here because that name popping up and having some malevolent stuff going on. I hope it's not a demonic name that they were getting. This hotel seems like a quaint place to stay. But guests might get more than they bargained for. Is the Thomas House Hotel haunted? That That is is for you to decide. decide. Well, just another reason to check out Tennessee. It's got all kinds of great stuff there. There is so much on our list. We definitely need to get up there. We need to have multiple lifetimes, too. This is true. We'd love to have you guys check out our website at historyghostbump.com. And if you want to send us some feedback, you can do that at historyghostbump at gmail.com. We heard from Leah and she said, Hi, ladies. Hope you're doing well and getting over COVID. I wanted to share a story of something that happened to Liz and I this past January. On December 31st, a very dear friend of ours passed away from colon cancer. Mike was only 45, leaving behind a widow and three small children. His death hit us pretty hard, but we knew we had to throw some sort of wake to celebrate his life's journey. Mike was literally the funniest person you'll ever meet, a constant joker who knew how to get you to smile even on your worst days. We've been told he joked up until his death, no surprise there. The night of his wake came and we got to reconnect with so many amazing friends we hadn't seen in years. About halfway through the night, the fire alarm goes off in the restaurant. We just look at each other thinking it's a joke, of course. This can't be happening at Mike's wake. But lo and behold, we're told to exit the building to wait for the fire department. After 30 minutes, no fire department came, but we luckily had a guest with us who was a firefighter and she put a call in. Not even two minutes later, we heard the trucks. Long story short, no burning building. But from the fire department live stream, we found the reason for the fire alarm going off. Haze in basement. Oh, wow. The fire department checked, and there was zero evidence that someone smoked in the basement. No one had even gone down there in the two hours we'd been on site. To this day, I believe wholeheartedly that Mike was that haze. That he made the alarm go off, basically saying, you think you can party without me? We don't believe in coincidence. When our waitress said, I've worked here five years and that's never happened, and it happened the one night we're there to celebrate a practical joker's life, you'd be the judge. Was it Mike? I think it was. What do you think? I think think it was too. Very cool. She said, stay awesome, ladies. We hope you feel better soon. Thank you to Leah and Liz. Thank you very much. Brian sent us an email and he said, you and Kelly are funny and Mort is funny also. And then he asked, is Mort a monster or does he just talk like a monster? So our response was, well, Brian, we're not quite sure. Most people when looking at Mort would call him a monster. It's true that he's not very good with his grooming habits, but he is shaped mostly like a regular person, and he can be very sweet. When he answered our call for a cemetery caretaker, we were delighted. 
We figured no vandals would bother desecrating our executive producer burials once they saw Mort creeping amongst the tombstones, crypts, and mausoleums. Yeah, his personal hygiene issues kind of work for him in that circumstance. Yeah. I'm allergic to soap. He is mostly a sweetheart. Sometimes he can be a bit of a, a troublemaker. and When he steals our phones and plays the games on them. <laughs> exactly. Mort needs a phone. And then Stephanie sent this email, and I just want to preempt this a little bit. If you are triggered by hearing about molestation or something like that, that will be in this email. Uh, She said, firstly, you both rock. I hope your recovery was speedy. I've been thinking about you. And we are feeling pretty well. I still every so often get that phlegm in the back of my throat, but that just happens all the time anyway. I have a story I'm ready to share. I've shared a little bit before, but this last year has opened up a whole new view of my life and childhood. So here goes. I lost my sister Gabby suddenly in 2013 due to ulcerative colitis. Her heart stopped a few times before I got to the hospital. She passed 15 minutes after I got there. We had a strong bond. We have the same mom, but different dads, so we didn't grow up together, but still we were very, very close. Our grandma made sure of it. Not long after she passed, I had the dream we were talking on the phone. Her voice was clear as day. When I woke up, I felt someone holding my hand, thinking it was my supportive boyfriend, now husband, but no one was in the room. Throughout the years, I still felt her and saw her in rainbows as there was a stunning rainbow after she passed. I was waiting for family to arrive to the hospital to say their goodbyes. Fast forward to May last year. I was visiting my dad and stepmom. We got to talking about my childhood and my stepmom told me that after she and my dad got custody of me about age two, they took me to the doctors and the doctors found that she had a severe UTI and some other stuff going on. So they, of course, figured out that she had been uh, molested. I have memories of things happening to me, but thought maybe it was all a dream. Worst part is, Gabby was left with our mom longer. We were neglected, malnourished, left with strangers, left alone, etc. My dad had friends scope in the place while he fought for me. This news threw me into a big meltdown. This last year has put me in a very dark place and made me miss my sister so much more. I was diagnosed with anxiety and depression, felt I didn't belong on this earth any longer, started therapy and it's been rocky, but I'm finally feeling in a good place. I've processed a lot of the trauma, hurt, abuse, etc. I have an amazing bond with our mother now. We are connected in a way we know if the other is sad or having a rough day. Gabby brought us closer. I know she would have wanted that. She told me years ago after we both met our mom to try and forgive. I've held on to those words. Forgive. The person my mom is today is an amazing, loving, strong woman who beat ductal carcinoma in 2015. Now that the history is out of the way, and wow, what a history. (laughs) Yeah, my goodness. I've been practicing meditation, using crystals, learning about my inner self, and feeling an awakening happening. On a particular rough day, I was doing a meditation when my spirit guides and a little girl came to me. I couldn't see her clearly. I suddenly felt Gabby's presence. It was undoubtedly her. I can't explain it, but when you know, you know. You know? (laughs) LOL. Anywho, I believe my sister's watching over me. I believe she was waiting for me to make this realization and blossom. I believe she knew I would need her strength and guidance. And I believe she had worse memories. Her life was really rough and she felt she didn't belong on this earth. So much has changed about me and how I see the world, myself, others, etc. And now I'm getting started to go back to school and become a kindergarten to third grade teacher. Excellent. It's been what I wanted as long as I can remember, but I held myself back for so long. I find it interesting. I want to help small kids. Coincidence. Very cool. Yeah. I don't think it is a coincidence. No. So I had written back to her and um, just said, it's amazing to be able to have a healing relationship with her mother, number one. Definitely, I have no doubt that her sister definitely has guided her and her mother into this forgiveness and better relationship. And then I said, anybody who knows me knows I'm not crazy about kids. So having your dream being teaching kindergartners to third graders, (laughs) I was like, more power to you. You're so funny. You always say that, but you are so good with kids. (laughs) But I do think it's a wonderful calling for her because she will be there to to help these kids who at the same time in her life, it would have been good for her to have somebody to help her too. Yeah, definitely. So thanks so much for sharing that, Stephanie. And we're glad that everything is moving positive for you. You definitely belong on this earth. We want you here. Yes, we do. We want to thank everybody for tuning in to this episode. I've been your host, Diane. And this has been Kelly. You take care now. Bye-bye. This episode has been brought to you by our executive producers. You can find History Goes Bump on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, Pandora, Google Play, and anywhere you can listen to podcasts.
join us for the history and haunts of the Thomas Hotel. Nope. Okay, we got it. The white water was used for dyspepsia. (laughs) I don't know if I said that into the mic, but my mom would try to get me to take Pepto when I was nauseous and it never failed. It would make me puke. Never helped soothe my stomach. Always did the opposite. I, I always felt good after I took it, but now as an adult, I don't care for it. I really don't care for the commercials on TV. I mean, singing about diarrhea. Come on. <laughs> oh, the, the interesting commercials we have these days. <laughs> they can say anything in a commercial these days. This is true. Aunt Suki's brother, John D. Kirkber. He has a great last name. Why can I not say Kirby? Kirby. It's like the vacuum, which are pieces of crap and really hard to maneuver. Wow. Tell me how you really feel. <laughs> Good I, I cleaned for a couple people back in the day, like 20 years ago, that had Kirby's that insisted I used it. And oh, my God, these they, things were heavy. Trying to put the attachments on them was a nightmare. They probably are still working, though. <laughs> they probably are. I mean, they better. They cost like a thousand dollars. Most of these springs were on the Jesse Jones farm, and he happily sold a 20-acre plot surrounding the springs to a businessman. He mean to pay. He was a businessman. <sighs> a man. He's a man. Katrina and Jock visited this Lokini. Lokini? It was a Lokini. <laughs> <laughs> like a bikini. Lokini? You wear a bikini at that location, and it becomes a Lokini. Or a martini. <laughs> Do they serve martini? Have you had a martini? <laughs> that might be the problem. <laughs> As Jazz, Jazz, his name is Jazz, He's and jazzy, all that Jazz, Jazzy Jack, 